Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ed3 podcast, where we explore how to make education more accessible, affordable, and better accredited. I am excited today to welcome a friend and brilliant mind who is combining experiences from the classroom with knowledge of the future of technology and education in his role as educational designer at the Education Design Lab. This uh, Crookston pirate not only knows the best beer and coffee in the Red River Valley, he's also leading Experience U, which is a joint project between Education Design Lab and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they're working to accelerate adoption of learner employment records, or LERs, at scale using AI. So we'll dive into that. He's not only reimagining education, or when he's not reimagining education or planning for East Denver, you'll find him yelling school for the Vikings or leading his Little League teams to the World Series. So let's welcome a true Renaissance man, the best Reynolds since Bert, your friend and mine. It's Colin Reynolds. What is up, Colin? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I, I am almost speechless with the amount of information you dug up about me uh, in that intro. The Kirkston Pirate is a, is a nice callback. Kirkston, Minnesota is not a place a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and now everyone knows that our mouth got the pirate. Um, and so and thanks, it's one of thanks for that intro. That, uh, when you and I met, it took a little while to figure out that we're kind of from the same part of the world. So the Red River Valley in Fargo and near Kirkston, a uh, good place to grow up, I'd say, right? It's a great place to grow up, I think, especially if you're really interested in, in uh, commercial agriculture uh, and farming of any kind. I think it's fun to see the, the growth of just farm culture and the awareness around it. But yeah, the Red River Valley, there's no richer soil uh, in North America to grow any crop. Well, my, my uh, factoid is always that the Red River flows north. That always blows people's minds. I enjoy that one. It is. And, you know, since we, we are on, you know, a, a modern equivalent of radio, I, I got to give a shout out to KROX Radio 1260 AM in Crookston. Uh, the Fee family has been running that thing for years. And I feel like anything that I've ever learned about radio uh, started with them. And the reason I was my first, the reason I'm able to do interviews is my first interviews were actually after some, some baseball, football and hockey games. Uh, with with Frank or Chris V um, on KROX. So if they ever hear this, uh, they they know that they're they've had an impact. Well, that's a great callback because um, I got my my first job was at KVRK Radio in Brookings with <laughs> Dallas Cole. So I was the one on the board, you know, connecting the interviewer, uh, making sure it got on the air. So you know, it, it kind of tells uh, if anyone wants to know our body types, <laughs> our skill level. You were the athlete and I was the guy on behind the soundboards. <laughs> yeah, well, in small town America, you got to know everyone pretty well. And so you, right. you I know, are a jack of all trades as well and, and can do a lot of different things because you just grew up in a place where you had to. Right. Soil's so rich, you know, you got to do it. So yeah. well, I'm excited to jump in. We get to talk a lot, but not always about shop. So um, let's start in the zeitgeist. You know, everybody's talking about artificial intelligence, AI, it's been exploding this year, but how does AI fit into education and educational records specifically? And how do we know it's not just a fad, like that people want to throw AI at everything they can right now? Yeah, I'm really glad that you contextualized it to uh, learning credentials specifically because the broader uh, conversation around AI and education could go any number of directions, right? And like yeah. the chat GPT conversation, I feel like is really pushing to the forefront things that uh, have been around for a few years, but now it's it's having a direct impact literally in every classroom. It kind of reminds me of when Wikipedia first came out and teachers and professors were saying it's not a scholarly source, you can't cite it, but you know what? It is a it's a valuable tool for a very specific uh, use. And if you can if you can teach people how to interact and engage with any tool, in this case, you know, AI, um, there's, there's potential value to be harvested there. And there was a quote, uh, gosh, I'm already, I'm already going to start name dropping people here because okay. I've learned so much from people in this space, but Phil Kamarni, who, yep. uh, leads a, a lot of different projects around the, the VC EDU and just greater, you know, education, uh, technology conversation said, you know, AI is not going to steal your job, but somebody that knows how to use AI might. I think that's a great example of, of what this is happening, what, what this tool and, and sort of technology is doing to education more broadly is that it's giving a human a chance to be in the loop and participate and leverage technology in a really practical, meaningful way. You know, we, we had this sort of burst of the information age and 
all this data and all this text being available online and through the internet. And, and now we're trying to make sense of it and we need tools to help us make sense of that. So as it relates to the learning credential ecosystem, I think you and I are great examples. Like we can tell our story, we can talk about our experiences and share those, you know, in conversation or on resumes or, or whatnot. But the skills that we have are really hard to represent um, through a resume or through just a conversation. Sometimes you need a little verification or you need some kind of evidence to support a claim that you've made about a qualification or an experience or a skill that you have. And that's really what AI is uh, helping us to do in the, the technology space. Look back on our experiences, look back on the digital evidence, our digital footprint, if you will. There was a phase when digital footprint was like the thing. Yeah. Um, so let's take that footprint and let's let's make sense of it in a way that allows uh, individuals to have a little more um, digital value as they're searching for jobs, as they're searching for opportunities, whatever those opportunities might be. Yeah. So could we say this is the equivalent of Googling yourself, right? Like looking at your own history, things you've done, but you know, a lot of what we've done, like your interviews on the radio, they might not be on the internet yet. Um, is AI essentially recalling this stuff for us so that other people can see it? Or how do you kind of think about it in practice? Yeah, I think it's a combination of all those things, right? Like Googling yourself, you know, uh, I, I'm not that egocentric, but that, that's something I'm in the habit of doing. But every once in a while, I think it's healthy to go on and see what the internet has to say about you or what other people have to say about you. Um, so there's a little bit of that. I think it gets a little more specific. Uh, you know, if you think about what is on a LinkedIn profile or a social media profile of any kind, uh, there's a lot of information there that the individual asserts, right? Like I say that I have this experience. I say that I have these skills, but there's really no level of verification or validation that's associated with that. It's really still kind of my word. That's the the employment and hiring or talent pipeline system that we use today and, and even application process for, gosh, I watch families apply to to preschool, right? Like I, yeah. I was a part of a private school admissions board that was reviewing applications for three-year-olds, right? And these are, these are families that are making assertions about their child, yeah. right? And so we just trust that what they say is true. Yeah. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is help technology um, prove that that information has some evidence to support it and that institutions and employers have opportunities to verify that, yeah, this was an employee of our organization and they did do these things for this amount of time. And we want tools to automate that because if you think about any boss, the idea that they would go through, or if I contextualize this for me as a teacher, that I would go through one by one, verify the skills that I remember each student of mine having during the time I interact with them, that's insane. That's just not humanly possible. So if we can get tools to help us do something, that humans just can't physically do. I think we're, we're onto something. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think about when you think about where are the last pieces of paper, that's usually a good place for a digital company to be formed. Uh, yes. I think about here in Fargo, uh, there's a great company called Bushel and they basically noticed that, you know, when farmers sell their, their grain to the co-op, uh, it's still being paid for with a piece of paper. Right. And they're writing down the balance. And it's like, oh, we could replace that with a better system, like basically bring banking into the, into the crop sales, right? And like yeah. about whether it's health records or education records or immigration records or travel, you know, a lot of times you have to like find that birth certificate still. I know as a parent, like I have issues. Um, and I imagine with preschool example, you know, you're not only doing that with one school, you're doing it with multiple because you try yeah. to get in, you don't know where your kids are going to go. Um so I wonder, I was going to ask that question, but this is a great time to bring it in. Like as a former teacher, how do you think about these learner employer records or LERs and, you know, using technology, actually helping teachers in the classroom? So you gave like a good start example there, but I'm wondering how does this actually improve the lives, hopefully, of teachers and make schools somehow more efficient or better run? Yeah, I, I'm going to try to summarize this uh, succinctly and not go too far off the rails, but I, I got to touch on uh, the, the education records that you mentioned and the comment you made about immigration papers, because I think those two are great use cases that we see a lot of groups um, focusing on solving for. Um, and that first, the education records, like I, the privilege that I had growing up in the place that I did is, is I, I have to acknowledge that. And the thought that 
at my my parents' house, I still have the the big stack of drawers that have all those, you know, handwritten notes, certificates, badges, whatever I earned through my primary years in education literally exist in these drawers in my in my parents. Now it's in their garage because they moved out of the house I grew up in. But I could go access those very easily, do a bunch of PDF scanning of all of them. And now I have these digital records that we would take AI and try to harvest some skills out of or make sense of, show trends or patterns over my life, things that I was interested in that, you know, could project me into this job or that job or what have you. And I know there are groups that are doing this right now. Um, but then when you look at the immigration side of things, like oh, typically, it's especially refugee camps, those groups of people don't have that luxury, don't have that privilege to be able to, to just go back home to grab their records and bring them with them, right? Or even transfer them into some digital form. So some of these, some of these tools and some of these systems are really trying to capture something that's physically been lost, but still in, exists inside that person. And I think that's what is at the heart of all this to me as a teacher, is that individual that we are working with, that I was teaching in the classroom, is a human being that has their own experience and their set of experiences that they're going to take with them and they need to be able to tell a story. They need to be able to tell their story. They need to be able to articulate their skills and their experiences and their knowledge in a way that will allow them a new opportunity to do that, whatever that thing is, um, for however long they want to do it or, or they're given the opportunity to do it. So what does this look like in the classroom? I mean, I remember all the lesson planning. I remember I like writing learning objectives, talking about skills that kids are going to learn. I think this translates into some of those systems that we use to lesson plan and uh, document those learning objectives or learning standards. Those systems will now attach some of that skills data or those learning outcomes with some evidence to package up into a portfolio of sorts, which is already happening, but they're going to contextualize that and package it in a data format that allows for transferability and interoperability out in, in a system and then outside of that system, right? If I go back to Crookston High School, what information do they have about me? And how can I get that information into my wallet, into my backpack, into my, and I know that we're going to touch on those buzzwords now too. How can I take those credentials with me uh, to, to further my opportunity or, or economic mobility? Totally. Yeah. And I think it, if individuals can show what they know, they can then get a more personalized experience, right? So I think about, think about teachers in the classroom. If you have your three learning objectives and you see that all of the class already has two of them, like you can go straight to the third one and save time, right? Or the students who, you know, might in the past might have to stay behind or not go out to recess because they have to catch up. Like, yeah. and if we can target those areas and now you're not only moving people through faster, but also hopefully not marginalizing them, probably making them feel stupid, right? Like by like maybe one skill they don't have um, hurts them overall. So I think that could be really interesting for individual teachers. So so walk me through like why AI is needed. And you can talk a little bit about the project you're doing, um, you know, with experience use. So you're encouraging people to explore AI and LER. So, so what role do you think AI is going to play? And what are you kind of hearing from early applicants? Well, there's, there's a couple different angles that groups are taking. And one of the first one I think really humanizes the approach, which is building AI agents to actually interact with a human to personalize their, their learning record, learning and employment record, um, in a way that, uh, accurately reflects who they are and the skills they've acquired. And so chat GPT is sort of a good, uh, you know, analog for this because Somebody logged in at chat GPT and now they have a, they're starting to have a conversation and this, this agent remembers the questions you've been asking and starts to build on those sorts of things. And groups have been doing this, right? Like the United Airlines now has a, as an automated messaging system that comes through my text messages, my bags missing or whatever. And they try to understand what my problem is and help me get to a solution. So these agents are, are doing that for individuals. So there will be this sort of conversation piece, um, at least as one group, a couple groups have been conceptualizing it for us, where I might talk to, it might actually be talking, could be typing, but the voice I think is kind of exciting. Um, and then they'll generate sort of a, a record and reflect it back to the person to say, hey, 
you, you said these things, which kind of sounds like you have these skills that you might've acquired in this experience. Mm -hmm. Is that true or not? And if it's not true, tell me more about that. So we can, we can really drill down and personalize the record we're building. Yeah. So it's really like personal narrative turned to digital record, right? <laughs> like, um, that's really fascinating. So I don't have to, I mean, I always date myself. Even my wife laughs because she's a few years younger than me. But I remember I applied for college with a typewriter um, and had to use white out as I was filling out the essay, right? And imagine not having to go through that process of filling out the intake forms for all the sites and all the right. places you want to go, right? I can just talk to someone. It creates this record. And then that record is shareable across college applications, preschool applications, job applications, whatever it might be. And do we have a... Is there an issue right now with interoperability or does AI then step in and help that? Yeah, I, I'm not going to try to take us too far down the Web3 yeah. rabbit hole or talk too much about blockchain solutions because I think the, the type of technology that we use or the way that privacy is secured in some of these tools is really up to the individual teams and, and the components that they put together. But I, I do think that there are, there are some switches that can be flipped in these conversations and in the building of these tools that allow individuals to have a little more transparency into the way something is being built or the way something is offering them opportunity that we just, we really don't have right now. So in terms of interoperability, those records that I've referenced, like if I need to get any kind of record. It is incumbent upon me, the individual, to go back to that institution, that organization, and collect those, right? And then I have to put them somewhere. I have to manage that whole process. That's where I think AI and that's where I think some of these tools can really help to serve individuals is that they put that individual at the center of this. And for that solution, they need a storage place. They need a storage spot, whether that's a wallet or something on their phone or, you know, on, on drive in the cloud, they need a place to host this stuff and they need those formats to be in a way in, in a structure that allows them to share them on their terms. And that's where the, the web three technology and some of these tools that have, you know, consent packaged in them or have uh, progressive disclosures structured in them really create a, a kind of a new way of imagining how you share your information. Right. And I know. Uh, a recent guest on your on your podcast, Evan McMullen, talked a lot about um, the example of the driver's license, right? If you need to show somebody your age and they need to verify your age, they don't need to see your home address, right? Like, but that's what happens when we give a state issued ID, right? A passport is actually probably a better way to verify your ID because there's there's really no more information on that passport, um, more personally identifiable information or PII for that person to sort of take. And we just kind of trust that individuals won't go and then steal our, our address, you know, from our ID or, or any other piece of information. So I think, you know, that concept of a, of a structure or a format that's universal across wallets, across tools, across solutions is really exciting, but the complexity comes in, you know, the getting groups to speak that same language or use the same tools when they have systems that they've been using for, in some cases, you know, decades that mm -hmm. don't really easily translate or, or interpret those data formats or structures, uh, the, the way that we would want them to. Yeah, no, that's, and that's definitely a barrier, I think, to learner employment record, um, adoption. I think another one is employers. That's why I was really excited to see that you're collaborating with the Chamber of Commerce. So tell us a little bit about the employer side you know, why the chamber got excited or got, you know, wanted to, to collaborate with you on this project and, and kind of how that fits into this world. Yeah. So the, the U S chamber of commerce foundation has a, a variety of different groups that they sort of bucket these projects into. And that the T3 innovation network is a, a so-called network of networks that really focuses on some of these projects that have, you know, innovative solutions or, uh, implementations of technologies that, um, you know, have great promise. And so. They represent, you know, a thousand or more individual businesses across the country, right? Think of your, your local chamber of commerce, right? Kirkston had a chamber of commerce that was working on all these things. Fargo's got one, Brookings has one. Uh, but these groups are really, they're, they're advocating for the businesses. And so what we're hearing from employers that the, is that there's this skills gap 
employers have jobs and opportunities that they want to offer individuals. And the way that our talent pipeline is structured now is that a lot of those opportunities are needed by these um, very clear uh, requirements, most of which are a degree, right, of a two-year degree, a four-year degree or whatever, um, that are preventing people who don't have those requirements from even applying. And so what they, what the employers are trying to do is shift that focus away from, or they're trying to learn how to uh, identify skills that are needed in those jobs and individuals who have those skills to get them into those jobs and sort of expedite that process. Uh, Because the process right now is very labor intensive for humans. It requires, you know, hundreds of hours for individuals to, you know, for the individual who's applying for a job, but then the team that's reviewing the application like that, that is not an easy uh, or, you know, seamless process. And it, and it's riddled with bias all the way through, right? Individual bias, structural bias, systemic bias, like you name it, there's bias all over that place. Um, And so what, what the employers are really trying to do is that, you know, to their credit, they're trying to reduce that bias or mitigate the amount of bias by focusing on, um, solutions that technology enables. And so that that's why I think employers and the chamber are interested in this project is that they really want to create solutions that have AI and ethics considerations built in from the beginning um, to enable opportunity for both sides of that sort of the so-called last mile, the high, higher spectrum. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So where can, if someone wants to learn more about the project, where should they go to kind of read more or, or watch the progress? Yeah, so the T3 Innovation Network is really the the place that this is being housed. And there's a T3 uh, network resource hub uh, that these projects get posted on and all the resources are sh- are shared in. Uh, so that would be the, I think, the a great place to start. The uh, Ed- Education Design Lab also has um, some information up on their website about uh, this project and in the in the weeks and months ahead they'll be more shared publicly um, and more posted as we get moving yeah no that's amazing well let's talk a little bit about kind of your your recent experiences so previously you were at learning economy you're uh you know you help out with ETH denver and now you're in this newish role with the education design lab so curious what surprises you've come across or new things you're learning in this new role and uh kind of what's excited you i guess about that kind of uh, new position yeah, I, I think what's excited me most about the this role with Education Design Lab and the work that they're doing is the is the focus on humans that it's impacting and the relationships that are being built across the variety of projects. You know, there are these uh, sort of pseudo departments. Um, Ed Design Lab is um, a, a remote company now, um, but there are departments that are doing work across the country, specifically with. Uh, institutions of higher education, which ends up kind of leading to conversations with some of those state governments and some policy writers. Um, and so in all of that, the the conversation really comes down to the individuals that those institutions or organizations or governments are serving. And what are those, you know, sort of personas of the individuals that they're impacting and that you can't build, uh, you know, one persona that's going to categorize any group of people ever. And so they're building relationships with groups and, and involving individuals in the process, in the solutions um, from beginning to end. And that, that's really exciting to me. It's also very labor intensive, which is why it requires, uh, you know, big team efforts uh, from the design of the project all the way through the end of the project. Um, you know, groups like Learning Economy Foundation, the, the technology solutions that they're creating and sort of these leading edge um, technology ideas that they're exploring, uh, go hand in hand with these types of opportunities. And that's another thing that excites me is that although I like technically stepped away from learning economy foundation, I am now working in a space where we are collaborating directly on projects together, where we see the pairing of the, the technology and the humans in a way that, uh, is, is truer to the human experience and allows individuals to uh, take ownership over that technology. So it's less of like the technology being done to somebody and more of that person being incorporated in the solutions as we're building and integrating. Yeah, well, that's really, uh, that's a great picture to paint. And maybe to wrap up kind of uh, as a final question, just future cast a little bit with that. So looking ahead, you know, three to five years, kind of with what you're working on, what you're hoping to achieve, 
um, how are things different, you know, in the education system for learners and for teachers or employers, like as your work continues and as we kind of get uh, maybe LERs and AI sort of adopted more in a, in a more widespread way? Yeah, you know, I, Scott, I wish there was a sort of like flick silver bullet answer to offer to this, but I think the, the reality is, uh, and in all things education, you know, time is a constant and, um, and learning is a variable, or you can say it the other way and learning is a constant and time is a variable. It really depends on the, the person who it's impacting or the person that's going through those experiences. And so this idea of a human in the loop, um, for development, for integration and for implementation, like that, I think is going to be a growing trend where the curtain is kind of pulled back of, uh, uh, so that the technologies and what they're doing is revealed a little more and individuals are going to care a little more, you know, um, I, I think they're going to care to the extent that they see the opportunity that's integrated in it. Why do people use certain apps? Why do people use certain technologies? There's typically a very distinct reason for that. And the technology itself, nobody really cares about. Like when I, when I grab my phone, I don't really care how Wi-Fi works. I don't really care why I can dial a number and talk to my friend on the other side or why this app gives me content that makes me laugh. I don't really care how those pieces work. What I care is what I'm getting from it. And if what I, what I'm caring about is my, my job or my learning, and I want apps that are going to help me navigate that or provide me with opportunity, I'm going to care a little more about which apps I'm using based on the, based on the value that they're providing me. And so I think that, you know, in the next few years, humans are going to start to see that relationship with those tools kind of evolve into this place where it's like, yeah, I have choice. I have a little more choice now than I thought I had. I don't just have to use this platform or that platform. I can pick a platform that, that fits for me. I can cho choose a wallet that works for me. I can choose my bank that works for me. I, you name it, right? We're going to have just more choice, um, to, to navigate, which we're going to need tools to help us do that too. So it kind of perpetuates itself, but I see that relationship for every individual with these solutions, just evolving and growing in a, in a increasingly personalized way. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And. You know, I'm, I look forward to the day that our experiences in local radio will come back to give us big raises and opportunities. Um, I think that future is is coming soon. But until then, we're going to be watching your work um, uh, with the Experience U project. So I hope everyone checks that out. We'll be writing about it at ed3.gg. So check that out. Uh, but thank you so much, Colin, for jumping on and sharing a little bit about what you're working on. We'll look forward to watching online. Any uh, last minute thoughts or uh, places people can connect with you? Yeah, there are a lot of places you can connect with me. I don't like to throw socials out there, um, but, you know, Twitter is a, a space that people still connect. LinkedIn has become a, a great connection tool and a platform that I share a lot of content on. Um, but I love in-person meetups and I love uh, things that are happening in the metaverse space with groups like Ed3, the Ed3 DAO. Um, it has really kind of evolved in, uh, over the last year and that, that connects a lot of great people. Um, to opportunities in education uh, specifically, uh, especially Web3 and education. Um, but there's a lot of events that are that are coming up, um, you know, where we like to explore the intersection of education and Web3 technologies just broadly, um, uh, but also around infrastructure and the way the technology tools support uh, sort of that collision at the intersection. Uh, so yeah, find, find a way to reach out to me there. And Scott, thanks for the opportunity to chat uh, about all the things you know, I, I love signaling back to small town America because I think people forget that, you know, more than 50% of people in the world live in rural part. Um, and, and we can, we can contribute and build and make stuff too. Um, and, and that's, it's exciting to see the way that technology brings us all together and provides us a platform to collaborate, um, more, more equitably. That's right. Yeah. Whether you're in Crookston or Compton, you have an equal chance to to participate and have your record seen and heard. So we're excited to help people uh, show what they know and appreciate your leadership and work on this issue, Colin. So we'll look forward to seeing you next time you're in the Red River Valley. Yep. Thanks, Scott. We'll see you soon. Yeah.